Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar hosted by the Renewable Thermal Collaborative, or RTC. I'm Chris Kardish, the Industrial Decarbonization Fellow at the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions, or C2ES. Um, we are one of the three organizations that host the RTC. So today, we're going to be talking about a technology called thermal energy storage, which has strong potential to decarbonize a, a host of sectors, particularly those with significant heating needs like manufacturing. And we're gonna focus on manufacturing today. So after I set the scene, you're going to see presentations from three innovative thermal storage companies that are part of the RTC. We'll then have a short panel discussion with those companies and close with Q&A. Um, you can submit questions using the Q&A function on the lower part of your screen and we will answer as many as we possibly can. So it's important to start by distinguishing thermal from electricity. Um, so thermal energy is largely produced by combusting fuels at a factory or a building and then used in heating or cooling processes to make goods or heat buildings. So for manufacturers, this could mean heating water to use in a production process or steam from a gas powered boiler or direct heat for an oven or a kiln to transform raw materials like limestone. Um, thermal energy accounts for about 50% of final energy use globally and roughly half of US industrial emissions. And relative to electricity and transportation sectors, industry has received less attention. Um, we think that's starting to shift. And industrial sectors are especially hard to decarbonize. You've probably heard in part because of how much heat they consume and how different each individual industrial sector is in terms of their production processes. So the RTC was formed to accelerate the decarbonization of thermal energy. In addition to C2ES, the RTC is run by the World Wildlife Fund and David Gardner and Associates. So what do we do exactly? We bring together companies and organizations that are large consumers of thermal energy with companies that are developing solutions across a range of technologies like solar thermal, green hydrogen, renewable natural gas, uh, electrification, and many other areas. So our members are largely big companies with big manufacturing footprints in the US and globally. Then the solutions providers are the sponsors and you're gonna be hearing from some of those sponsors today. We come together in working groups and as a whole to assess uh, barriers to deployment and to push for solutions, especially on policy, but also on technology and uh, market development. So what is thermal storage? Like battery storage, we're temporarily storing energy, but in this case, we're heating or, or cooling a storage medium to store thermal energy. And then we're using various energy sources to do that. So particularly renewable electricity, but also solar, biomass, and waste heat from industrial processes. So thermal storage is sometimes divided into different types based on the storage materials and processes. The companies you'll hear from today are working with commonly available solid materials like rocks or ceramics, which are heated in insulated containers. So thermal storage could be considered a technology to electrify industrial processes. The companies you hear from today are heavily, though not exclusively, producing thermal energy from electricity. And while we're focused today on industry, thermal storage has much wider application, including for buildings and utilities. Um, so what exactly is the RTC doing to advance thermal storage? We launched a working group uh, this month with the goal of accelerating the deployment of thermal storage at its heart. We're going to be doing that by first assessing both potential of thermal storage and the various market technology and policy barriers that stand in the way. And we're going to translate that into concrete actions that we as the RTC can take and in partnership with other stakeholders and then to get to work addressing them. So there's surely a lot of work to be done on policy. Uh, for example, the Inflation Reduction Act took an important step in creating an energy storage investment tax credit, but it doesn't incorporate thermal storage for industrial sectors. And we think that's one clear gap. So if you're interested in learning more or engaging with us, we'd love to hear from you. And lastly, um, we'll be continuing conversations on thermal storage in a host of other solutions at the RTC Annual Summit, October 20th and 21st. Um, we'll also be hearing from 
Department of Energy officials and their industrial decarbonization efforts and implementation of uh, the major pieces of legislation we've seen over the last year. And of course, we'll also be talking about how the IRA has advanced renewable thermal and what we need to be doing next. So the URL to register is in the title of this slide, but I'll also drop it in the Zoom chat along with my email uh, if you are wanting to engage with the thermal storage working group. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to our first speaker. So first up um, is Caroline Joe from Rondo Energy. She is the vice president of project finance, and they're doing a lot of interesting things. So Caroline, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, thanks for having us here. And also thanks for setting up the stage so well. Um, I don't know if I see the presentation yet, but if you all do, I, I do know the content. So, oh, perfect. <laughs> uh, great. So if you off to the next slide. Um, Chris laid out a, a, a great uh, depiction of the, the scale of industrial decarbonization challenge that we're facing. And when we were thinking about it at Rondo, what we came up with was Rondo heat battery. Uh, so what you see on the right here is the Rondo heat battery. Um, just to give you a sense of scale, we're thinking about two standard units, one that's an RHB 100 to around 100 plus megawatt hours of storage, and the larger one is around 300 megawatt hours of storage. Uh, but if you hop to the next slide, Chris, thanks. Um, what you see here is that the driving mantra was to use really century proven materials in order to figure out a way to store electricity as heat. So this is a picture that was taken from one of our earlier prototypes. And what you see here is that when the wire is, you know, quote unquote, plugged in, uh, it gets very hot. And as it gets hot, it radiates heat and it charges the bricks on the sides. And the bricks on the sides are what we put a lot of thought into, into how do how do we design the brick structure in such that it, it's able to retain heat um, and charge rapidly in a way that doesn't harm the bricks themselves. Cells. So the diagram on the next slide is actually what Chris actually showed you. So you had a little bit of a primer there. Uh, but the way the, the, the way that the Rondo heat battery works, it's able to charge from a variety of electricity sources. So it could be anything from an off-grid to an interconnected solar or wind facility, or in some places where it makes sense, we could charge directly from the, the wholesale markets. Um, and when we charge, quote unquote, charge, the, 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 we, the wires inside will get hot and radiate heat. And as it radiates heat, it will be able to warm up the bricks that that are surrounding the wires themselves. And in this way, we're actually able to get up to the high temperatures that we need for a lot of the hard to decarbonize sectors. So we're looking at 1100 to up to 1500 degrees Celsius. Uh, sorry, Chris, there's animations on this slide. So if you continue <laughs> clicking, you'll see them flow through. Um, and as a result, we're able to charge energy uh, for, for hours or days. That said, to be frank, the, the most you know, immediate use case will be for for daily charging and discharging for a lot of our industrial customers that are you know, looking for 24 seven industrial heat. Um, to put it bluntly, the reason why rapid charging is important in this case is because we're trying to take intermittent renewable energy. So say charge in four or five hours and just charge 24 seven um, at the reliability and uh, reliability uh, and 24 seven kind of uh, uh, dimension that, that our industrial customers need. Um, and because of this, we're actually quite efficient. Um, you can imagine if you're taking electricity and then uh, trying to produce heat, and heat is the output that a lot of industrial customers need, uh, either in the form of hot air or steam, uh, then you're able to get up to 98% efficiency with the Rondo heat battery. Um, so as you can see in this diagram, once the heat is stored in the battery, you have air that's blown through from the bottom, it gets hot as it rises, and then of course you're able to sell it off as hot air or for steam by connecting it with a boiler. And really the, the driving cause for all of this was how do we build a product that's able to deploy rapidly? How do we build a product that's able to depend on a lot of low cost proven and materials that are available at a giant scale? So we're able to de-risk a technology that we're then able to roll out to a lot of different industries. So the diagram on the left is really just a picture of electric heaters. And all of you are probably familiar with an electric heater. It's no different than what you see in a hair, dry a hair dryer or a toaster oven. I will say the ones in our factories are a lot larger, um, but it, it's the same type of electric heater with a slightly different alloy. But on the right, this is actually a cross section from a refractory brick. And what we use in our technology is refractory brick. And this has actually been used in the steel blast furnaces for around 200 years. Um, 
I think that's when the first patents were. So we really were trying to depend on old technology repurposed in a specific way um, in order to scale the, a new application. So if you hop to the next slide, this is really what our breakthrough design is for what we have patents for. So a lot of the brain power went into trying to figure out the unique configuration of these bricks in order to be able to create bricks that are able to distribute heat rapidly and uniformly. As mentioned, the reason why this works is because we're able to charge very quickly. So the four or five hours, you've seen the duck curve in California, say. Um, and because it's able to charge rapidly, we're able to store renewable energy and still deliver 24 seven heat. Um, and it's in this way, you'll click through and the animations will come through, but as the wires get hot, you'll distribute heat uh, in a way that's rapid and in a way that doesn't harm the bricks themselves. Uh, so this is where a lot of our brain power went into and for which we have patents for. If you hop to the next slide, you'll see that because of this way that we've we've actually designed the bricks, we're actually able to serve 95% of industrial heat. Uh, we're able to look at customers from chemicals to petroleum refinery to food and bev to iron and steel. And these are some of the first projects that we're actively developing right now. So it's very much across uh, different types of industries. Um, and this was, if you hop to the next slide, Chris, you'll see that this was actually um, reflected in, in the partnerships that we're forming. So these are public materials, but we are actually actively focused on developing um, solutions for the cement uh, sector, which has been traditionally one of the harder to decarbonize sectors, uh, to try to figure out ways in which we could decarbonize sector that traditionally has been hard to decarbonize. And it's not just with the cement sector. So if you look across the, the different types of industries, we're working um, with developing customers in cement, steel, chemicals, as well as, as a lot of other different sectors, including CCS um, and minerals and mining as well. So to give you a snapshot of where we stand now, we have a two megawatt hour unit that is currently in construction and will be online within just over a little month. So later half of this year. Um, and then we also have another unit that's coming online. So that is a smaller of the two standard units that's coming online next year. And both of these units are currently in production. Um, but the reason I'm here today is, is hopefully we'll have some time to discuss uh, this as well, is when we were talking with our customers, we realized there's really two different types of sales models. Uh, one is, is just a CapEx sale, and that's traditionally something that's simpler, and, and a customer will just come to us, tell us they want a Rondo heat battery, and just buy it from us directly. Um, but then another model is heat as a service. What we realize is for a lot of our industrial customers, they're used to buying natural gas on an ongoing basis. Um, as mentioned, for a lot of our industrial customers, we are drop-in replacement for an existing natural gas boiler that they already have on site. Um, and the sizes that I mentioned are not a coincidence. They're actually sized to specifically be a drop-in replacement for a lot of our customers. And as a result, because they're used to buying natural natural gas on an ongoing basis. Uh, the hope was also to be able to develop a heat as a service model, which is what I'm actively developing with our team, in order to be able to provide you know, a fixed term contract similar to what solar PPAs did for the renewable energy sector, uh, so that customers don't, feel, don't have to put up CapEx costs up front, but as a result are able to pay for zero carbon steam on an ongoing basis. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to the other panelists and, and look forward to hearing your questions. Thanks so much, Caroline. Uh, super interesting to see the range of applications and, and a really interesting project pipeline coming up. Um, also moving into heat as a service. So that is a lot of food for thought there. Um, next, let's hear from Gadi Sharir, who is the U.S. Managing Director of Bren Miller Energy. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for having me over. Uh, thank you, Caroline, for the super interesting uh, presentation. Uh, so uh, we are a thermal energy storage uh, provider. We're based out of Israel. Uh, can you switch to the next slide, please? Uh, let me start with an overview of the company, a quick overview of the company. The company started, was founded in 2012 by Avi Brenmiller, who is an expert in the solar thermal field. He developed and installed over hundreds of megawatts of uh, solar uh, thermal power plants in Spain in, uh, in the US actually involved in the first uh, solar thermal power plants in the Mojave Desert back in the 1980s. Uh, he sold uh, his company to Siemens and uh, started his own uh, over a century ago, focusing on uh, thermal energy storage. Uh, over the years, we raised over $100 million. We are publicly traded on 
NASDAQ and um, Tel Aviv Stock Exchange, and uh, we are approximately 70 employees. Uh, our focus is on the CNI segment, low to medium temperatures, and as well at uh, power plants uh, scale. Can uh, next slide, please? Uh, I see you change it a little bit, Chris, but uh, never mind, I'll adapt. Uh, so what you see here in the middle is uh, the basic module. Uh, it is a 40 feet uh, module by one and a half and one and a half. Uh, we use crushed rocks as our storage media. We store it at temperatures up to uh, almost uh, 1400 degrees F. Uh, that's the reason that we also serve uh, the low to medium uh, range. Uh, uh, but the uniqueness of our uh, technology is not in the in the storage media that we use, but it's the configuration that uh, we have and now we connect it all. Uh, the storage media, the heat exchanging elements uh, inside and the uh, steam generator all in the same box. So once you charge it, the, the output that you get uh, is steam. Uh, the unit is uh, scalable, uh, can range from single megawatts to a hundred megawatts and even more when we look at the utility scale, uh, it is clean. Uh, it is durable. I mean, uh, you can, it can last you over 30 years, uh, regardless of the amount of cycling that, that you do. Uh, next slide. And the way that uh, it works is that you can either charge it with electricity. We have resistive heating elements embedded inside the unit with a conversion uh, efficiency of over 99%. And that can be directly from the grid or from a nearby a renewable source, or you can charge it also with a high grade heat uh, with a certain amount of cleanliness, obviously, if it could be steam, biomass, biogas, anything that, that can charge it to the required uh, temperatures that uh, we need. And then uh, we discharge uh, steam at the output, but it can also obviously discharge hot water uh, up to uh, 930 degrees F which uh, basically makes it suitable also for sous-vide uh, steam, should we want to uh, inject it uh, into a steam turbine and generate uh, electricity. Uh, but uh, in this particular session, I'm going to focus on uh, the industrial processes. So in, uh, we can always get the, the required saturated steam for industrial processes and manufacturing plants. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, when we look at the, the unit that we already have deployed, uh, you can uh, see on the left-hand side, this is a project that we have with uh, the New York Power Authority, NIPA, at SUNY Purchase, that's State University just outside Manhattan. Uh, there we connect it to a turbine where once uh, we generate electricity with the turbine, we capture the heat coming off the turbine, we circulate it uh, uh, in, inside our unit and we charge it uh, accordingly. Uh, and if we need uh, more uh, thermal energy with, based on the demand coming from the college, then we also have electric heaters, which are embedded inside the unit and they can basically top up uh, the required uh, thermal energy and uh, we supply 100% of the thermal demand coming from uh, the college. On the right-hand side, uh, we have uh, our unit uh, deployed at the manufacturing plant in Brazil. That's uh, a manufacturer of uh, plastic uh, water tanks, big water tanks. Uh, it needs uh, hot air uh, at the range of just uh, shy of 600 degrees F for its rotor molding machine. And what we do there, we basically act as a buffer between the biomass, which uh, is charging our unit, uh, and uh, the requirement, uh, the thermal demand requirements coming from the client, uh, which operates in batches. So basically, we enable continuous operation on the one hand, on the one hand with the biomass source, and then uh, we absorb all the noises coming from the manufacturing plant. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we signed a similar uh, project uh, recently with uh, Philip Morris International, uh, replacing their uh, natural gas boilers in uh, the manufacturing plant in Romania with uh, a biomass uh, source in our thermal energy storage. Uh, there we are installing uh, just over a 30 megawatt hour uh, thermal energy storage capacity with a discharge rate of 1,818 uh, megawatts. That project is expected uh, to start uh, commissioning uh, early next year. Next slide, please. By that, uh, I'm done. Uh, went quicker than I expected. Uh, you, you cut me short with the slides a little bit. Uh, 
we'll be happy to answer any questions uh, following uh, the Q&A. Thanks, Gadi. Uh, it's super interesting to see, first of all, the, the versatility of the applications you all are, are doing and um, also just sort of the, the different feedstocks that are different sort of energy sources that you, you are able to sort of take on. Um, the last for the presentation portion before we go to the panel is Jordan Kearns, who is the Vice President of uh, Project Development at Antora Energy. Thanks, Chris. Can you all hear me? Am I sharing screen successfully? Thanks. Sorry about that. Um, it's nice to go last. I feel like uh, Caroline and Gotti have said most of what I need to say. Uh, as, as Chris mentioned, I'm Jordan. I lead project development for Antora Energy. You know, I think the stage has been set nicely. We're all here because I think we see the same opportunity, and that is that wind and solar electricity represent the lowest cost sources of energy uh, available now. That's true not only on a levelized cost basis when you include the capital cost, but it's particularly true when you look at um, real-time prices of power, the marginal cost of production or the, the operating variable cost of production from wind and solar is effectively zero. And what we see now, even in areas with fairly modest penetrations of wind and solar, uh, quite frequently the price of electrical energy will, will collapse to, to very low values near zero or, or even negative pricing when the wind is blowing or the sun is shining. And with the amount of wind and solar that we have uh, demonstrated politically, especially with the recent Inflation Reduction Act, the amount of wind and solar we are going to add to the grid, that abundance of very, very cheap, very clean, but intermittently available low cost power is, is going to just explode and, and continue to rise uh, across the United States. Obviously, though, for, for those of you on the uh, industrial operation side, we can't power our processes with an intermittent source of, of energy. This is the, the common gap from, from storage. We have this raw energy resource, this source of primary energy that's incredibly cheap, incredibly clean, but it's meteorologically driven. And we are trying to operate an industry, a 24-7, uh, if not baseload process, at least a dispatchable process that you're operating based on your own constraints, and those are not meteorological constraints that you want to be dictated by. So really, uh, Antura, but, but really I think all of us here are, are trying to build the missing link between those very cheap, very clean sources of renewable generation that are intermittent with a reliable source of, of energy. One unique aspect of our offering is we are looking to output not only high temperature process heat, but high temperature, but, but electricity as well from that system, very similar to a traditional combined heat and power system that I'm sure all of you are familiar with. How we do it, our approach is, is really quite similar. We've all honed in on a, on a similar uh, approach. And I think that you know, really bodes well for all of us that we're all on to something. I'll try to point out the areas where we're a bit unique in our offering. Uh, essentially our solution is thermal storage, uh, resistively heating, a thermal mass to very high temperatures to decouple when that electricity is available from that use of that energy. In our situation, we're able to take intermittently available electricity at low prices from the grid, or even from a co-located source of renewable wind or solar, and use that to resistively heat, in our case, blocks of carbon to very high temperatures in excess of 2000 degrees Celsius. Uh, we've chosen carbon because it really has quite remarkable material properties. It has a very high heat capacity, which means each increment of temperature that we uh, increase stores a massive amount of energy. It can also, as I mentioned, reach a very high temperature. So not only do you have many increments of temperature that are uh, each storing a lot of energy, you have many increments of them, if, if that makes sense. So it, essentially it drives a very high energy density. A high energy density drives a smaller footprint that's easier to site as well as lower balance of system costs. The cost of that raw storage material, that carbon block is also incredibly low. Uh, this carbon is produced on every continent at the megaton per year scale. It's a byproduct of the petrocoke process, something that's incredibly earth abundant. It's not based on any rare earth materials. It's an existing byproduct. It's an incredibly cheap, incredibly dense storage material. It's also quite simple. This stays solid at high temperatures 
Um, there's no phase change, no high pressures. Essentially, we're heating the block up to very, very high temperatures until it literally is, is glowing. And that glow is infrared radiation, uh, the same way that we you know, feel the sun, sun's glow in the form of photons. Photons are being emitted from this carbon block the same way your toaster starts to glow when it's getting very, very hot and electrically heated. And can take that radiation and transfer it, transfer it to a heat transfer fluid, be that a hot oil, a steam, or a gas. Um, and in our case, also uniquely, we can reconvert that heat back into power using a technology we've developed called a thermophotovoltaic or TPV. TPV is very similar to a traditional photovoltaic, except instead of taking photons from the sun, we're taking infrared spectrum photons from our carbon block to reconvert that into power. I mean, no disservice to the brilliant engineers on our team, but really from a thermal storage standpoint, what we're doing is we're taking a very old, century-old uh, technology and just putting it into a box suitable for use in an industrial process. This is a picture of a graphitization furnace. It's a 100-year-old plus technology. You can see on the side these electric resistance heaters uh, coming in from the side to heat up blocks of carbon. In this case, uh, covered simply by a pile of carbon black as insulation. You can see where some of the infrared radiation is leaking out from gaps in the insulation there. Uh, this is done sort of haphazardly in an open environment, obviously not suitable for an industrial setting. Essentially, what we've done is take that exact same technology uh, and understanding and, and put it into a box that we could locate at an industrial site. The steel container inside these containers, what you see if you open them up, is really the same thing. You're going to have rows of blocks of carbon with electric resistance heaters coming in heating those blocks up to a glowing temperature. And then the, the one difference is we've now added what we call these discharge modules onto the side that can basically see that thermal radiation and extract it in the form of heat or power or a combination of the two. Uh, it's a modular design, so we can basically stack as many of these together as we need to serve your industrial process needs. Really the vision that we have for this technology is to be something that can either come in alongside or even eventually completely replace your traditional combined heat and power systems that I'm sure many of you are operating at your facilities. A single solution that instead of taking natural gas in can take intermittently available electricity as an input and output dispatchable heat and power. From a project development standpoint, we're currently deploying projects with a heat only output. Our electricity output is a few years down the road in terms of scaling up that technology of the thermophotovoltaic, but we currently have heat output products under development in the US and Canada. If you are a significant user of industrial heat and are potentially interested in exploring early adoption of this type of technology, I'd love to have a follow up conversation with you. Uh, my email is, is on the slide here, and I'm sure you can reach out to Chris as well for that contact information if you're interested in continuing the conversation. But with that, thank you so much for your attention. Thanks, Jordan. I think you do a really good job of just distilling the technology. Um, very, very uh, comprehensible sort of way. Um, I would love to now kind of move into a short panel from us, and then actually looks like we're doing good on time. So we should have lots of time to take questions from the audience, uh, which are starting to come in through the Q&A function. Um, you can keep those coming. Um, but to, to start it off, um, I was hoping that we could kind of talk about what are the biggest challenges you face with deploying your technologies at industrial facilities? Um, and even thinking more broadly of, of getting sort of industrials to think about this technology. Um, so let's start with Caroline. Yeah, that's a great question, Chris. Um, you know, maybe I have my own biases here, given what I what I do day to day. But I think a big challenge really is the project financing piece, um, right? I think we're really on this this sprint to get it de-risked as quickly as possible, so that we could get traditional investors on board to be able to unlock it as a service for industrial customers. Um, the reality is, for the the bulk majority of industrial customers that we're talking to, um, some are able to make capex purchases, but the the majority of them are only interested if they're able to actually get a heat as a service type of structure in place. The reality is that their operations um, and their budgets generally are structured in such a way that they have, because of their experience with natural gas, are, are just paying on an ongoing basis, right? And I think being able to unlock that type of model for the space would be critical for, for industrial decarbonization. De 
industrial decarbonization writ large. Um, in order to get there, I mean, in many ways, I tell people project finance is, is getting the perfect project in many ways, right? There's a lot of things that have to be teed up, a lot of de-risking, a lot of certainty. Um, but I think being able to put all those pieces in play is going to be critical for the sector. It's a very good answer from a project finance specialist uh, getting at the also the de-risking aspects there. Um, I'm sure the others can relate to that. Um, how about we move to uh, to Jordan? Sure. I'm, I'm going to follow Caroline's lead and say that the, the greatest barrier is not technical, which I think is true for a lot of these. We're all pursuing pretty technically, don't say straightforward, but but with a strong basis of um, existing technology is, is what we're using as a small stepping stone to where we're going. I, I would say the biggest barrier that we face is really on the regulatory side, particularly with how energy is bought and sold. Um, batteries as a whole, especially when co-located with an industrial facility, really don't fit within the traditional utility service model. And we have some uh, anachronistic laws that were written at a time that didn't imagine this type of co-located self-generation, distributed generation. This is something that we're seeing a lot with distributed wind and solar. Uh, but, but fundamentally, if you can't access the electricity directly from a renewable generator or through the grid on a very time varying or real time rate, that price of electricity is going to be too high to be competitive with, with natural gas. Even though we know the underlying economics work in, in many states, you can't simply plug in your load to a um, renewable generator without jumping through uh, a lot of regulatory hoops and hurdles. Um, so with that, I would say it's really, how do we, from a regulatory standpoint, get access to, to markets, get access to directly connected renewable generators, but then also it's, it's a patchwork. Every state, every utility has different regulations that limit scalability uh, as opposed to having a, a single national policy. So we know FERC has been moving on, on some of these things and paving the way, but there's still a lot more uh, work to be done there, Chris. Including work to be done by the RTC, I would say. Including work to be done by the RTC, definitely. Of, That's something that I really think all of us um, uh, as uh, sponsors here could could work together supporting. Yeah, definitely. Um, Gotti, um, love to hear from you too. Uh, yeah, I think that, uh, first of all, everything that Kauna and Jordan just said, I mean, I can relate to. I think that we are talking about an untapped market. I mean, you know, this is a new market that is forming. And it's not the pure economic play that we come to these customers and tell them you want to switch from your conventional boilers into this technology and you're going to make uh, uh, such and such return. I think it's uh, it's bigger than that. We're talking about decarbonization. And the challenge here is about changing the mindset. And it's about coming to uh, all these uh, manufacturing plants and making them understand that it is not maybe mandated today and the numbers, we still need to work through them. I mean, we do, We still need to get the infrastructure in place. I and mean, Jordan just touched about it. I mean, changing the entire paradigms. And I think that getting to the right people that, call, uh, that have the responsibility, having the understanding of what uh, where we are heading, that, that is a critical uh, piece that uh, we need always to encounter once we get to those clients. I think that this is uh, one of those challenges. Definitely. Um, I think you've all three hit on some major areas of work for all of us. Um, to move to another question, um, sort of logically follows from the challenges. So what are the, what are the big changes and supports that are most needed to address some of the challenges you just brought up in, you know, thinking in terms of regulatory policy, technological market, what are, what are the changes we need um, to address some of these barriers you both you all just introduced. And let's go opposite order this time. Let's go to Gadi first. I think it's mainly regulatory at this stage. I think that uh, we have the targets, but we don't have the tools in place yet. I mean, uh, it's not just um, uh, having the proper infrastructure, but it's having the required uh, mandates coming from the, uh, from, uh, the regulators enabling uh, such technologies eventually to be deployed at the uh, manufacturing plants. I mean, I think that, and I believe that uh, probably the, the rest of the, the panelists here can relate to, I mean, making the, the numbers work, I mean, uh, with uh, such a cheap fuel, uh, it's not easy when you need to add additional costs that uh, uh, you can uh, get from electrification. It's different when we look at uh, wasted heat recovery, but when we look at electrification, I think that, uh, 
we are basically all looking in, into that. Uh, we are still missing critical points uh, on the utility level, on the state level, things that not only enable it on the CAPEX. I mean, we have a lot of stuff that is coming in on the CAPEX side, but we need the OPEX to work as well. I'm getting a sense that a lot needs to be done on a sort of state by state basis. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, this might be uninteresting, but I'm just going to echo what, what Gadi said on the regulatory side. And, and one thing that we can do on that is, and one thing that, that we are doing as, as Antora is, is working with utilities to demonstrate to model tariffs that we'd like to then take to other utilities and say, you know, I, I know a lot of people are, are have questions about, you know, how does this compare to, to natural gas? And, and I think the goal for Antora and, and, and likely all of us here is, is cost parity with fossil fuel resources. I can say that that is our goal. I don't wanna speak for the other panelists, but I would imagine that is their goal as well. Um, to do that though, you need a very low cost source of primary energy. And you can only get that if you have a sophisticated electricity tariff that allows you to purchase power at times when renewables are very abundant and have very low value in other applications because of that overproduction. If you don't have that, there's no way you can have a, a low enough cost. And right now that exists in many places in the United States, but, but not everywhere. So we're working with um, more forward thinking utilities that are interested in being sophisticated to put together these sorts of real-time tariffs, demonstrate them at projects to show this is a way that can work not only for the project, but also for the utility as a source of valuable load growth. They just have to be a little bit different in how they think about charging for power than they have historically when all of the large loads were essentially you know, flat base load non-controllable types of loads like our thermal storage systems are. So yes, regulatory and specifically on the tariffs as well would be would be my answer. Um, thanks very much. I think we've got two great regulatory answers. Um, Caroline, what do you, what do you have for us? Uh, it does seem like we're we're all addressing a lot of the same challenges here, which is great. Um, I will say take, taking a step back, I think generally raising the profile of these types of, you know, solutions for industrial decarbonization is something that we will need across, not just with our customers, but with our regulators and in the current zeitgeist as well. Um, in many ways, I think the Inflation Reduction Act made that clear. If you read through the print, the hydrogen folks were very good at making sure their voices were heard. And I think it's really on us to make sure our voices are heard as well in order to show that in many ways, we are the cheapest option when it comes to decarbonization. Uh, everyone has presented their, their presentation here, and it seems, you know, it's, it's clear that because of the types of materials that we're using in many cases, we're able to achieve not just cost parity, I would say in some cases we are cheaper. I mean, you see natural gas prices in a lot of places of the world, we are the cheaper, more less volatile option, more predictable option. And I think that's what a lot of our customers are seeing. Um, and raising the profile of industrial decarbonization solutions that we could bring uh, across the board is something that we need to do a better job at. Which is yet another task of the RTC in this in this thermal storage working group. Um, and thanks so much for those for for those excellent answers. Um, I we have a, a pretty long list of questions here from the audience, and um, not surprisingly, um, there are questions about about cost comparisons here. So I and I, I do think you know we should tee that up. So one person asks how how does your technology compare? with you know natural gas boiler sort of on a levelized cost of heat basis and is this a financially attractive technology or a, a technology that companies need to be willing to pay more to get the carbon benefit so competitive in, in its own terms or with the green premium um i, I can i can yeah. tackle that if that's all right or, yeah so for those of us that are using wind and solar as a charging resource our costs are obviously going to be at least somewhat proportional to the wind and solar. So there's a geographic component here in that the costs that we can offer for zero carbon heat are gonna be much lower in places that have lower cost renewables. So in the US places like uh, the Plain States where you have abundant wind, places in the Southwest where you have solar, you're gonna see a lower cost where you're gonna be uh, at that cost parity level. Elsewhere, you're probably looking at a, at a carbon premium. I can also say the second component of, of cost for these systems is the CapEx. You have to pay that out over time and that gets amortized over each unit of energy you're using. Uh, just, just to be you know, frank, as a, as a newer technology, that's a cost curve that we're still pushing down. So we expect our earlier deployments to be at a, at a slight premium in, in many markets, uh, but long-term we're targeting cost parity or even below the cost of, of natural gas on a long-term basis. Obviously, if you're looking at gas costs today, 
that's a very easy target to hit. So that's not the target that we usually look at. We don't think, you know, eight, nine, $10 million BTU gas is the long-term norm. We're looking at really being competitive, not with where gas is today, but once gas returns to, to a normal, uh, hopefully quite soon a post-war uh, market. Thanks for that, Jordan. Would anyone else want to? Because uh, we, we can move on to another one, but if anyone else wants to step in and add anything to that um, on the sort of the, the cost question. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, I think Jordan really hit the nail on the head. It is very much dependent on two main factors, I would say. The two main factors are the cost of natural gas and the cost of electricity. Um, in places where there's a lot of renewable energy penetration, I, sometimes the cost of electricity could be zero or negative, right? Uh, but I think as a result, it's very project by project specific. There are some customers that we're working with when we already beat natural gas today. Um, and we were already beating natural gas even before the war. Right, but it very much then depends on the types of resources that you deal with in, in that specific geography, as well as the natural gas prices that the customer is facing. Thanks for that. And um, Gadi, I don't know if you have anything you don't no, want to add. Not, not much to add on top of uh, what uh, has been said so far. I think that it depends on the location. I mean, uh, cannot give a straight answer that will cover all states. I think that uh, still today we need to look at the uh, additional mechanisms on how we can make it uh, uh, compatible with natural gas. I, mean, I don't think we're at the stage that now that we can uh, beat natural gas, uh, uh, you know, uh, head to head. But I think that uh, when we get to those access energy that uh, is being uh, generated and we can capture it, and that's uh, the, the added value of thermal storage, right? I mean, the fact that you can play with, uh, there's a meaning to time of day. The fact that you can take those uh, times when uh, electricity is the, the cheapest, if it's uh, on the grid, and uh, I'm not talking about the point if the grid is uh, dirty or not at this stage, uh, but I think that uh, you can capture uh, low cost electricity, you can get uh, capture access energy uh, that there has no use to it during wind time, wind uh, during the night or solar, depends uh, in which location. And then uh, we are talking about different numbers, but again, it, it varies from state to state. Yeah, I think pretty clear messages from all the panelists there, um, but also clear that that thermal storage is competitive or more or even less costly in, in certain markets, uh, which is encouraging. Certainly, a need for more policy support um, to help address those gaps, but also very encouraging. Um, you know, I have a. I suspect that yeah, this comes from a company, and I think it's a very sort of practical question for someone sort of thinking about decommissioning uh, a natural gas boiler. And so they they ask what happens to a natural gas furnace after uh, or, or boiler um, after the solution is sort of implemented at the facility? Are the clients keeping them around or are they sort of entirely decommissioned? Are they reusing portions of, of the parts? Um, how exactly does that work? And I think, I suspect, Gadi, you might have um, a pretty good answer there. Right. I mean, uh, again, uh, we leave it to the customer to decide. Some customers uh, rather have uh, them, uh, you know, as sort of a backup to our solution, uh, at least for uh, the first few years. Uh, again, we are talking about uh, a new technology, uh, new uh, deployments. Uh, so uh, some customers feel safer with having uh, this redundancy in place. Uh, but there are others that uh, want to go decommission and go completely, I mean, uh, clean and in that sense and not even consider them as backup. Uh, I think that sort of an interim time that uh, to begin with, uh, we were living in, in place, but then uh, uh, then it can be decommissioned uh, over the years. Yeah, I think very similar. Um... You know, the projects that we have under development are our first commercial deployment. So there, there's always some level of technology risk, even though it's based on, you know, a proven and relatively simple physical underlying principles. So we, many, many of the customers we're, we're working with are, are planning to leave that as a gas backup system for any sort of emergencies that might come up. And it's not even necessarily a technical risk standpoint. We're targeting with our battery, you know, two to four days of, of storage. As we saw in February of 2021 in, in Texas and parts of the Plain States, you can have, um, you know, meteorological changes that last for a week or two. And that doesn't mean, 
if you're, if you're wanting to rely on electrical storage there, that will mean you're, you're purchasing electricity at a time when it is very expensive. Having that optionality, especially if you've already paid for that CapEx, is, is frankly just a smart move. Um, so we see a lot of people leaving that infrastructure in place, both for an emergency technical backstop, but also just from an economic optionality standpoint. Thanks for that. Um, Caroline, I don't know if you if you have anything or I can move on to another question, but if you, if you do want to step in, um, you're very much uh, welcome. No, I, I, th I think we were experiencing the same thing in our discussions with customers. I will say another way that customers also tend to structure it is, you know, if they have decarbonizing some of their sites requires a lot of heat batteries, right? So it'll be in stage gates. So they, as the technology becomes more de-risk, then they decommission more and more of the boilers and then implement more and more of the heat batteries. I, that's generally the model that we see. Got it. Um, somewhat, somewhat similar vein, kind of again, thinking of this from the, the facility or this or the end use, um, how should an end user sort of take the next steps in assessing thermal energy storage for their needs? What are, what are the things that they need to consider? Um, and I'll leave that open to whoever wants to start, whoever's most eager and wanting to start. Oh, I, I just threw my email up in the chat. So if anyone's interested in having a conversation, looking at what a deployment might look like at, at their site, that's something that we have a team of people that are happy to do. That's not something we charge for. That's just part of our business development process is we're happy to look as we've said, you know, a lot of this is geographic dependent dependent on local regulations. So it's hard to just give one number uh, that would be easy, but it wouldn't be true for, for any of us just throw one number up on the screen. So if it's something that you're interested in taking in the next step on, we're happy to take that step with you and do a data exchange, sign an NDA and put together sort of a first level cut at what something might look like at your specific facility. So the, but the, the, the factors that they're sort of, you know, you're typically seeing from a customer who's exploring a project, what are sort of the big factors that they need to think through or that you, you know, all help them think through as you're sort of planning a project? I think yeah, that's we, we look at like load, load factor. Um, so, you know, what, what type of heat you're using, how often you're using it, your ability to access a source of clean and inexpensive electricity. That's a regulatory question. That's also a, a, a resource question for the area. In some cases, if you're looking at a direct connect, that might be a land constraint question as well. So your ability to access inexpensive electricity and then what your loads look like, those are really the two sides of the equation that we're trying to put together. And then all of that exists in a regulatory environment. Yeah, I'd, I'd say the same. Um, I, I think also another factor too is, you know, if there are any climate decarbonization goals at the corporate level, that's a lot of what's been fueling a lot of inbound interest as well. Um, so definitely feel free to reach out. I don't know if I could message everyone on the chat function here, but Chris, I know you have my email, so feel free to share that with the thread. You're free to, to use the, the chat function and share your email with everyone. You should be able to, to do that. Right. I will give it a shot. Um, I think that uh, just to add to uh, what was said uh, until now, I think it's about understanding the process. It's about uh, expertise. I mean, uh, I think that uh, when the customers approach us, they expect us to understand that their thermal process is better than they do. And uh, for that, we need to understand exactly, not just how the technology works, but also how the uh, entire thermal processes work. So it's uh, understanding uh, everything around it uh, and getting, a, as Jordan said, the, the low data, the annual data, so we can uh, then uh, use it in our model and understand exactly what they need. and. Uh, and price it accordingly. So to take a slightly different tack for this next question, um, maybe take a step back a little bit um, from this sort of more operational project question. Um, so, and I, I think we kind of already were hinting at it in the earlier parts of the panel, but you know, it seems that a lot of partnerships will be needed to sort of advance thermal storage deployment. So what sorts of partnerships um, and again, you sort of already hinting at them before, utilities, um, you know, renewable energy developers, what sort of partnerships are needed and with whom to sort of help with wider deployment? I could start us off. Um, I, I, I think this is something that we're all experiencing, right? I think the question is, how do you take a product and make it into a project? 
Um, and project development requires a lot of partnerships, everything from, as you mentioned, uh, solar developers, utilities were mentioned as well, to investors, right, to EPCs, to folks that we could actually work with to bring the projects online. Um, I think those are all the types of partnerships that we're working with and, and looking for. Caroline mentioned several. What one I would hit is just renewable developers. You know, the first wave of renewable development, the grid was much less congested. Uh, we just assumed that we could build the renewables everywhere and sort of wheel the power to wherever it needed to go. Uh, but we're finding a lot of those good sites are, are taken up. What a lot of people don't recognize is just how much energy goes into industrial process heat. It's actually comparable. The amount of energy going into industrial process heat is comparable to the amount of energy coming out of all U.S. electricity generation right now. So there's a massive opportunity to create new deployments of wind and solar by co-locating these with load to sort of bypass some of these congestion issues that we're looking at. And that's something that we're working on um, at Entoro right now. I think that uh, energy providers from uh, our end is, uh, is a critical component. I mean, uh, we need uh, a strong local partner when it comes to uh, the integration of the entire thermal energy storage into the facility. Uh, we need uh, someone to bridge the, the, the reliability gap. If there's a new company, the foreign company that comes into the U.S., then uh, we need someone to uh, uh, be there with us so we can understand that we are in charge of the technology side, but the entire project uh, is also uh, the benefit of having a strong local partner, such as energy providers, uh, Iran Sense, or other uh, companies that uh, such facilities are used to work with uh, when it comes to engineering companies or EPCs, as uh, Caroline mentioned. Thank you very much, all of you. Um, one one of our participants is asking sort of, um, you know, trying to get at which which what, what your sweet spots are for each of your technologies. So, you know, um, are there sort of particular segments or applications um, that you're really striving for or for which your technology is most appropriate? Um, and you know, perhaps also how, in which ways some of you, your technologies overlap as well. So sort of the, the sweet spots, but then maybe in, in some ways in which your technologies um, overlap. Maybe we start with sort of the, the sweet spots and sort of what, um, what segments and applications you're really aiming for and, um, and best suited to deliver. In, in our case, I mean, uh, I mentioned it in the presentation, uh, we are focused on the low to medium range uh, temperatures uh, up to 500 degrees C. So uh, when looking at uh, the industrial clients that uh, operate and obviously food and beverage are the prime suspects and you have the plastics, you have the chemicals, you have the pharmaceuticals, uh, each of them has its own uh, processes that require this uh, medium range of temperatures. Uh, we also look into the utility scale. I mean, uh, we have a project uh, with uh, Enel at the combined uh, power plant that uh, combined cycle power plant in, uh, in Italy, uh, where we take in steam and provide back steam. So it's, uh, we are part of the steam cycle. So it uh, also answers the, uh, the requirements of a steam turbine. So I think there are a lot of sweet points for where we act, uh, but those are the main ones that, that we are targeting. Yeah, I, I would just add, I think we're probably all able to address process steam fairly well. What's nice about a steam boiler is you're making your steam over here, you have a pipe, and then you're using it over here. So you have that, you know, disentanglement, which makes it pretty easy to replace that. You don't think about a boiler as being specific to an industry. You really think about it as, oh, it's able to reduce steam in these conditions. I think that's probably an area of commonality that we all have. Uh, and, and Tora's system is able to reach incredibly high temperatures in excess of 2000 degrees Celsius in the storage material, and we can extract uh, useful heat at temperatures up to 1500 Celsius. So while yes, most of the work we're doing is in the steam side, we do have a sort of unique differentiation in being able to reach that incredibly high temperature uh, for, for some of the processes that need it. And Caroline, don't know if, uh, I imagine a, a cement plant might come to mind. But, uh... That's right. Yeah. So high heat temperature applications, cement, uh, steel, those are a lot of the things that we're looking into now. Um, how to even couple our systems with hydrogen, another interesting thing that we've been looking into. Um, so I think 
That said, the full range is really possible for our technology. So also have been looking into some of the lower temper temperature applications as well. Um, and actually intentionally sized our system. So there's two units, as I mentioned, there's a, a little over hundred megawatt hour, then there's a little over 300 megawatt hour. So different segments, as you could probably imagine of the industrial customer base. Um, so thank you, panel. I, I think we have time for one last question. It's really just a simple one. So what is one kind of takeaway you would give the audience here about your work, but maybe thermal storage more broadly? Um, your companies, but thermal storage more broadly. And I will see if Gadi wants to start us. I will start off. Uh, I think that uh, when we look at the uh, thermal energy storage, uh, I think sort of I'm not trying to be too too dramatic, but we're at the beginning of an era. It feels to me as if uh, when I go back in time is where PV was at the time. I think that uh, everything is about to change. People understand it, but they don't reali realize it yet. Uh, so it's our job, I mean, uh, to keep on pushing and having the right legislation and going back to RTC and your job, what you need to do. But on our hand, uh, we need to keep on uh, making sure that people understand the value that uh, you can get now from thermal energy storage when the market conditions are there to make it uh, market competitive with the convention on the generation of steel so far. Excellent. Um, Jordan or Caroline? I, I think that's completely right, right? I think we're on the brink of uh, zero carbon heat revolution, uh, which is really exciting. And I think Jordan mentioned this before, but the scale of industrial decarbonization is something that's very hard to wrap your mind behind, right? If you look at a heat load for some of the industrial facilities, you're looking at the equivalent of a gigawatt of solar, right, in some instances. Um, and, and I think those are magnitudes that are very hard to get our minds around. Um, but I think being able to understand that not only could, our, our goal is not cost parity, we could be cheaper and we could be more predictable. And I think that's the end game for all of us here. Um, and I think those are the goals that we're all striving for. And I think that's a message that should ring loud and clear, uh, that we are better and cleaner uh, and cheaper. Um, and that's why we're all doing what we do here. You'd be the tagline for the working group, actually. <laughs> uh, close it off with Jordan. I, I think I think Gadi and Caroline said it said it well, but I would just echo the scale of the opportunity is, is immense. And I think that we have clarity for how we're going to decarbonize uh, the electric grid, you know, wind and solar are going to be key components of that. We've seen electrification of vehicles, renewable diesel for heavy transportation. Those are each about a third of uh, U.S. final energy use. And there's another approximate third, uh, it's industrial heat. And that has not had the same level of clarity in terms of a decarbonization pathway that we had with the transportation or the electricity sectors. But I think that same theme of we're going to electrify these loads and use some form of storage to make that uh, dispatchable is really the answer that all of us here see. And that's the future that we're pushing for. Perfect. Um, and again, uh, we look forward to engaging with you all um, through this thermal uh, storage working group. And we thank you so much for, for joining us. Thank you each and every panelist. It was excellent. And uh, yeah, thank, thank you, Chris. You. Thank you, Chris.